How did the early Christians understand communion? Was it merely just a symbol? Or was Jesus truly present there with them in the bread and the wine? Or was Jesus present with the bread and the wine? Or was he just spiritually present? How is it that we can understand today what the first Christians understood about the Lord's Supper? Welcome to All That Catholic Stuff. I'm Chris Bray. When we look back at the first Christians, the early Christians, when we read the writings of the church fathers from the first few centuries of Christianity, we can get a very clear picture as to how the first Christians understood what the Bible passages that we so appreciate today mean. Like, there's not a lot of dispute about what the Bible says. It's actually more so a, a dispute about, well, what does it mean? What does this mean for us today? And I know in my own life, this was a burning question in my spiritual journey. It was like, I want to return to that early Christian church. I want to be a Christian just like the disciples that were handed the faith from the apostles. Like, what did they believe? How did they practice the faith? What was true to them? And in my discovery, this led me to the writings of the church fathers. And when we read their writings, we can really fully grasp and understand, get some perspective. And so one of the things that we so often dispute about in Christianity today is, well, what is communion? Is it just like this beautiful memorial? Is this reminder of us? Is Jesus spiritually present when we do this? Just like he says, when two or more are gathered in my name, they are, I am in their midst. Or is it a spiritual presence or is it actually really truly Jesus there in the bread and the wine? Is this merely a symbolic act? Like there's no real representation. Nothing actually happens. It's just a reminder. It's symbolic of, of our faith. How do we understand it? And when we read the writings of the early church fathers, we really get a clear picture as to what this is. We can take, for example, somebody like St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was uh, ordained as a bishop. Like he was a successor of the apostle John, like learned at his feet. And in 107 AD, as he was being on his way to be transported to the Colosseum in Rome, as he was captured by Roman soldiers, he was going to be executed, be eaten by lions, and he wrote these seven letters to seven churches. In one of these letters, he said, Beware of the heretics. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they confess not the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins. Ignatius understood this to be that if, if we didn't believe the Eucharist, like the celebration of the Mass, the bread and the wine, we didn't believe the Eucharist to be the same flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, then we were a heretic. See, Ignatius of Antioch had this very literal understanding of what Jesus said in John chapter 6, like, unless you eat my flesh, uh, you, you will not have life within you. You know, my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. You know, the, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And we can clearly see by reading Ignatius' writings is that, well, he understood that to mean literally. Like, we need to consume him. That the Eucharist, which is a fancy word for thanksgiving or to give thanks, like when Jesus broke the bread, he blessed it and he gave thanks. Ignatius of Antioch understood this to mean that if we didn't believe that the bread and the wine in the Mass in the Eucharist was truly Jesus, then you were considered a heretic. Like, I find that really compelling. Another prominent Christian writer, another church father is Justin Martyr. And around 148 AD, he wrote this. He said, For not as common bread nor common drink do we receive these. But since Jesus Christ, our Savior, was made incarnate by the Word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too, as we have been taught the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer set down by him and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nourished is both the flesh and the blood of the incarnated Jesus. St. Justin Martyr is saying within 50 years of the last book of the New Testament being written is that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I, if we were to be reading that, I'm not too sure how much more emphatic one would need to be in order to understand this in a literal way. Another significant church father, St. Irenaeus, in around 140 AD, he writes this. He says, For as the bread from the earth receiving the invocation of God is no longer common bread, but the Eucharist, consisting of two elements, earthly and heavenly. Like something changes, something happens in that Eucharistic prayer, in communion. That bread and wine isn't just ordinary bread and wine anymore, but it is supernatural. One of the biggest arguments that we hear today is that this is really just a symbol. It's just this beautiful reminder. And 
it is, you know, we don't want to negate that. This is a beautiful reminder for us. And it is, in a sense, a symbol, but it's not just a symbol. Theodore, in 428 AD, on his commentary on Matthew 26, he makes this really emphatic statement. He says this, he did not say, this is the symbol of my body and this of my blood, but this is my body and my blood teaching us not to look upon the nature of what is set before us, but that it is transformed by means of the Eucharistic action into flesh and blood. See, it's not just a symbol. This is what the church fathers are saying. It's not just a beautiful reminder or a remembrance for us, but it's actually Jesus present to us, body, blood, soul, and divinity. That communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, the Mass, is not just ordinary bread and ordinary wine. It's not just a symbol, but it's actually the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a participation in Jesus's once and for all saving act of Calvary. That as he is up in heaven, offering himself before God the Father for our, for our sake, for our salvation, every Eucharist, every sacrifice of the Mass is a participation in that once and for all saving sacrifice. When we read the Church Fathers, and there are so many numerous excerpts that we can read from the Church Fathers, we get this clear picture, this clear understanding as to what they believed communion to be. And what I find so compelling is that for them, it wasn't just a symbol, and it wasn't just a reminder. For them, it wasn't just ordinary bread and wine, but it was actually this participation in something more. Now, today, we so often as Christians, we like to argue and try and interpret Bible passages a certain way. And I'm going to be honest with you, like, I don't think anybody cares what Chris Bray thinks this particular Bible passage means. Because honestly, I don't care what Joe Blow or some other pastor thinks that a Bible passage means 2,000 years later. You know, what, what I'm interested in, what I care about, is like the people that the apostles handed this faith to before the scriptures were even written down, they had an understanding as to what communion was, and various other teachings as well. And what I want to get at is what they believed to be true. I, I want to get back to the source. I want to be like the early first Christians who were not only handed the truth from the apostles themselves, but were so willing to die for what they believed in. And what I find very fascinating is that the first Christians, one of the major charges laid against them is that they were considered cannibals for eating flesh and blood. I find that very interesting because it, in a sense, what we are doing, Jesus commands us in John chapter 6, unless you eat my flesh and my blood, you'll have no life within you. My flesh is true food. My blood is to drink. You need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. He commands this. It's not just some kind of metaphor that he goes on and on. He's emphatic to say, but actually what the, the church fathers and the first Christians of the first few centuries of Christianity, they understood Jesus to mean that every Eucharist, Every communion, every participation, we are receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Savior. And if we didn't believe that, then as in the words of St. Ignatius, then we were considered a heretic. My encouragement to people that are really searching for this and perhaps maybe even doubting the Eucharist is let's dig into the writings of the Church Fathers. They're all available on the internet for free. You can go read them, all of their writings. What I love about them is that a lot of them were faced with martyrdom and persecution and certain death, and yet they still wrote what they were handed, what they believed, what they were handed down to them from the, the apostles themselves. And personally, I find that very compelling. Now, they're not all gold. They're not all perfect. They're not always unanimous on all things. And we have to recognize that, that some of them, like, they, they did some weird stuff. And they're, they said some things that aren't necessarily accurate or true or, or communicated in the best possible way. But when we read their writings, what we do get is a, a commonality, a sense of really what the early Christians truly believed to be true as handed to them from the apostles. So let's go out there. Let's read that. Let's be inspired by their life, by their words, to go deeper, to receive the word of God in a profound way, in a transformative way, so that every time that we participate in communion, that we can be changed and transformed by the flesh of our Savior. If you enjoyed this video, I would be so grateful if you would consider sharing it with others who might be uplifted by it. Uh, make sure you go to my website, chrisbraymusic.com, to consider bringing me to your event. I would also love for you to consider supporting my ministry at patreon.com slash chrisbray. Thank you so much, and God bless you.